I'm just going to have a conversation. This is not a, you can speak up at any point, ask questions if you want. You don't have to wait till the end. We're just a room full of people who want to make games. I'm no different. I'm just that guy who wants to make games. So Puzzle Studio. So Puzzle Studio is a Rovio studio. We are here in Helsinki. Um, I think this is probably the original kind of studio that started Rovio. I've only been there three and so many years. Um, um, and um, what else on the Puzzle Studio? We have a huge design department. So we're up to 50 now. Um, so I'm very happy with that. But we'll get into how that breaks down. So introduction. I'm just the old guy who makes games. I've been doing it a long time. Uh, I challenge my designers to make sure we're crafting excellent experiences for our, our players. And that's really all based around motivation and, um, and behavior. Those are the two things we focus on. So as the beginning said, we're going to talk about narrative design and level design. So what is a narrative designer? So we'll kind of start with the basics. A narrative designer is a person that creates the fantasy that the game exists in. I think of it like a theme park. When you go in Disney, there's a giant place. It's got a lot of different little stories and events and activities to do in it. But the whole park is kind of what the narrative designer is in charge of. Um, that can break down between the theme. Is it you know cyberpunk? Is it Angry Birds? Is it um, murder mystery? It, um, and then it can break down also in the time, the place, the characters, and any of the events that come together. Um, so what does a narrative designer do specifically for us? Um, so they, early on, they create the concept, as I said earlier, kind of figuring out the location, the theme, those types of things. Then they transition over to writing, more of a skill than, than just creation, uh, where they look at what is the history of our world? What is the backstory of the world? Where is it currently at in its place of existence? What is happening in this world? I know a lot of those things you may say, well, Angry Birds never touches on any of that. Well, it kind of does, but we have to build it because that's what makes the team understand what they're building. If you don't build that backstory in your narrative of what the world went from to where it is now, you really don't know how to move that world forward in a good way that's cohesive. Same thing with our characters. The characters need a backstory. Uh, we did Small Town Murders recently, and we had a character who went from a newspaper like writer or a book writer to a detective. And it was important for me to tell the team, I need to know where she came from. Did she go to school? Was she in college? Did she live in the South, the North, the West? Where did she live? Where did she come from? Because that's going to tell you how to build that character in a way that makes sense. Because as soon as a player gets a character that doesn't make sense, subconsciously they're going to know that. It's going to fall apart. And it's going to give them those little moments of unease or friction, you may want to say, and if you get enough of those frictions in a world, it doesn't make any sense and people are just frustrated and they leave. So don't, if it, I don't know who's narrative focused in, in the room, but build your backstories, even if no one knows them but you. It's very important to move forward with that information. Um, some other things they do. Of course, writing, as I said. For us, though, writing is more of, again, that unknown information that most people never get. Very few of our games have a lot of text. Um, it's important to, well, also a lot of our designers, narrative designers, aren't first language English, um, which can also be a struggle since our games are primarily folks on North America. So luckily for us, our games are not real text heavy. Um, there is writing and there it's important when it is there. Um, but it's not the primary focus of our narrative designers to be great writers. They have to be great storytellers, but not, not necessarily writers. Um, and then um, designing systems. So I always ask every narrative designer I interview, do you come from a writing background that wants to get into games, or do you come from a game design background that wants to get into narrative? Usually that's one of the two paths, the primary way people come in. Um, oddly, I find most of them come from writing and want to get into narrative design and games, and, but they have no game background. So one of the things on my test that I give them is, you'll probably laugh at me, is can you design a bobble or a, um, what do we call it? A talking head system. Write the spec as part of the test. Like they have to sit down, write out the spec for a talking head system so I could give it to an engineer and they could build it. Narrative for us isn't just writing or world creation. It also has game design involved because they need to know how to tell that story in the game through their own designs. 
So it's a, a little bit of a hybrid. Um, and then um, collaboration, co well, co collaboration with the team. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but it's, it's a team sport, right? It's not an individual who makes games. We have to learn to lean on our experts in the other areas of, of, of the, the team to make sure we build the best thing. Um, what should you bring? Well, I kind of covered this a little bit. Um, this is one of the rare, probably going to put my foot in my mouth, maybe. Let's see if I do. Um, this is one of the rare kind of roles in the design department that I really favor academic. Um, normally, academics aren't key for game design. It's nice. It's a, ha a nice to have, but it's not a, ni it's not a have to have. Um, but for writing, for UX, and for economy, those three, I really do look for that academic background because it really helps you understand the foundation of what you're building. So knowing good storytelling structure, knowing what roles different player, uh, what different characters can play in a storyline and what they need to, to fulfill to make that storyline move forward, those are all key, and I tend to find people who come from academic understand that. I mean, you can get it without it, but it's just not usually a focus for a game designer to really study storytelling. Um, world building is key. Make sure I'm on the right slide, yeah. Um, world building is key as well, like we've talked about that. Communication is critically important. Um, anybody in any design craft, subcraft, communication is really probably the most important thing you can bring. If you can't stand up in front of a group, feel comfortable, tell them, I would even, let me backtrack, inspire them with what you're telling them, you're never going to be good at the job. I don't care how much other skills you bring. If you can't align everybody in the room behind your idea, you're not going to get anywhere. So if you're shy, if you're quiet, practice, 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 practice. Um, we have shy people in my design department. There are plenty of them. But I constantly push them to be uncomfortable. I don't mind to stand up in front of people and speak. So if, if you happen to be that personality, overcome it. It's a good thing to do. Uh, problem solving. Um, also another key, again, one of those key things for all designers, you have to be able to foresee a problem before it's actually a problem as much as possible. Um, the time that you get is limited to build things. Uh, you will gut your designs down to the smallest thing you possibly can. Um, and if you're miscommunicating, if, you're, if you give someone a spec and they go down path A when you meant for them to go down path B, you're stuck with path B sometimes at that point. So communication is key. Um, or problem solving is key, sorry. Uh, and then a player needs the satisfaction. Read anything you can on what players, what psychology is. Uh, I always, as an early designer, I was building Medal of Honor levels. No one knows that game, it's kind of dated. Um, <laughs> well, you played my games then. Um, but I remember early on, like, going to my director and saying, when someone walks in a room, if there's a split, which way do most humans go? There is a tendency. It's not 50-50. And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, well, we should know. Like, we don't want people to get lost. So these are things that we should be evaluating and understanding. So look into finding ways that you can gain off, uh, knowledge on, on, the, on what a player needs and, and meeting that. There's a design philosophy. It's a little old now, but I still think it holds true, and I'm sure somebody's updated it called PENS, P-E-N-S. Find it, study it, read it. It's still valid today. I'm sure mobile versus AAA, there might be some variations. Um, and there's a book on it, which they, I think they quit publishing because the company now contracts to do stuff for the game companies, and the book was taking money out of their own pocket. But if you can find it, I believe it's called Addicted to Games or something like that. But it's an excellent, easy to read for anybody. Uh, I'm not the biggest reader, uh, but th that's a book I love. And I read it every couple years just to keep up. I think it's called, if you, if you just look for pins, pins will lead you to a company there in Florida. I'm sorry, I'm, my brain doesn't hold names uh, and faces very well. Um, but if you search for pins, you'll find a guy who lectures on it. He's a... He's a um, um, PhD in something with human behavior. <laughs> You'll find it. Just search pins. Um, I think, th I'm trying to remember that. The company name is Immersive, but it's not spelled properly. 
It's one of those, like, we alter the word to make it our own. Yeah, good luck. I'm really helpful. Let's move on <laughs> before, before you all throw stuff at me. Uh, let's see. Uh, so let's move on to level design. Uh, so what does level design do? So they build the rides in the park. If, if narrative builds the park, narrative designers build the rides. Um, so what does that mean? It kind of... Um, if you think about a ride in a park, they can be slow, they can be fast, they can be scary, they can be happy, they, can, they have all these different emotions that people get when they get on them. They're not all the same. There are many of them are quite different. So that's kind of what a designer, a level designer, has to do within a level. You have to build the ride. I always tell my designers, tell me the ride. Don't, when you tell me about any design, tell me the ride. Explain to me the emotions that you're going to create as I go along this journey and how you're going to pull me in as a player. Same thing with the level. As much as we all think match three level puzzle games are probably really easy to build, there's quite a lot of thought that goes behind the intentions behind that experience. Um, an example I can give you is if you look at um, Royal Match. It's a new one that kind of broke some molds and people did things differently in that game. I don't know how I'm doing on time either. Um, Royal Match did something um, that we'd seen in other places, but uh, in the industry we call it a digger level. You start in a very small restrictive space uh, and there's not much to do in the beginning and then as you make early moves the board opens up very quickly and you start to move through the board itself. That's what we call a digger level. But they focused so hardly on that and so focused on that, that's all they did. And it really changed the way players experience levels. It was one of the big things. So there's a lot of thought behind the shape, the mechanics, the goals, uh, the number of moves. Um, and the emotions that we're trying to create during it. So key responsibilities. Um, of course, levels, levels, levels are key. I mean, that's the thing you live, breathe, and sleep to. Um, balancing, again, as I said, you're, you're trying to build that balance within the level and across multiple levels. Um, ideally, in the level, you're going to give a player a sense of challenge, a sense of relief, a sense of progression, a sense of overcoming the challenge and winning, or getting close to the end and winning, like a near miss um, is really important. Uh, the one thing I will say, though, because this is a battle, let's rephrase, this is a discussion <laughs> we recently had, near misses all the time fail. Don't let anyone tell you by a KPI that this is something that's successful and we should do it all the time. It's a failed state. Why? Because anything that's constant loses its impact. I love chocolate ice cream. I don't want it every meal. After two days, I'm going to be sick of chocolate ice cream. Emotions don't sustain their value if they're constant. So look at your, your KPIs for guidance, but don't necessarily look at it and go, every level that has a near miss is really valuable to us. Let's make every level a near miss. You will fail. So create near misses, create medium misses, create barely wins, create far wins. Uh, that variation is what creates that ride and what makes players come back over and over and over again. Um, so we talked about the player journey mechanics. So in our studio, level designers actually build mechanics. And some, they do not. Um, uh, to me, it's important that they do because I don't want them just to be a monkey in a room building levels. I want them to be creative in different ways and have more um, tools that they can play with. So in our studio, they are in charge of building the mechanics for the levels as well. So that gives them an, a different creative. My, my thought behind that is um, they're the ones building it. They know best what works and what doesn't work, that they should be the ones building the mechanics. Our game designers do something else. Um, collaboration, we talked about, you know, leaning on your others on your team. Play testing is a big part. Um, we, every team... You know, when they make levels every week, they spend a certain amount of time switching levels and playing them and giving feedback. Play testing is critical. Um, analyzing iteration, of course. Um, I'm going to save that part for later. And then knowing your market. Play other games. Uh, make sure that you are aware of the market. Uh, they're responsible for knowing uh, what kind of is out there, what people are experiencing, and how we can leverage it or stay away from it, depending on what it is. Um, so... Building the moment, building the ride, building the park. So level designers really have to think more than just the moment. They have to think that long ride, right? You want them to keep coming back, experiencing something new. Uh, problem solving, I've talked about. Communication, I've talked about. And of course, data, love, love for data. Let's say 
a fondness for data. <laughs> um, as I said, data can totally lead you down the wrong path just as much as it can lead you down the right path. And, path. and I've seen uh, data specialists go into one meeting and say, this is what the data says. They'll get challenged by someone, step into the next meeting and go, now this is what the data says. So data can be swung to extremes either way if someone's smart enough to do it. So always question your data. Don't just accept it. Um, so inside Puzzle Studio, career path for level and narrative. This could be a typical career path in many studios. Uh, we don't do this. We do a much simpler form, much easier, straightforward. Every subcraft, so we have level design, we have game design, we have narrative, and we have UX inside the design department. All of them follow the same path. All of them can be leaders, all of them can be leads of games, all of them can be directors. No subcraft is more valuable or seen higher than any other. So level design for us is not an entry into the industry. It's a full craft. If you do it and love it, stick with it and be a master of it. You don't have to go, well, I can't progress higher in my career if, if I don't move. We let you keep going even in level design. And narrative is the same way. You can be a lead designer on a game and come from the narrative craft. You just bring different skills than somebody from level would. Um, so this, I know you can't read it, but, uh, and I'll zoom in in a moment, but this is our career path for our, for our studio. And it took us about nine months to sit down and build this. Um, and every year we revisit it, discuss changes. Um, but this is pretty simple. The thing that I will highlight here, <laughs> yes, is that what we do that's interesting is when you hit L level four, we split. You can go into management or you can stay as an individual contributor. And this goes up equally, same pay. We don't, we don't change the pay. If you're just an amazing level designer but don't want to manage people, your expertise gets you the same pay that you would be being a manager. So we do this because not everybody wants to be a manager, and, or should be. And often, really, the skills that got them there aren't the skills that make them great managers. Um, so my closing, because I know my time. Uh, how am I on time? Where's the clock? Okay. Um, so I always have little mantras. If you worked in my department, you'd hear them all the time, because um, I like to plant things in people's subconscious, so when they're working, hopefully they come through in their work. So I have, I have pages of these types of things, and I know it's very fortune cookie-like, but I'll talk about the highlighted ones, what I expect out of my designers. Passion is first. We're not making hangers. We're not making paper clips. We're not making license plates. We're making games. We're making entertainment. If you don't have a passion for what you're doing, don't come make games. So if it's not embedded in you, that's something that you just have to do, you're probably in the wrong place. Um, it's a team sport. No one person can make it. Well, okay, I can't say that nowadays. There's every now and then one person makes a game, and sometimes they're actually amazing. Normally, it's a team sport. Lean on your experts. Uh, personally, I think a designer I isolated by themselves is a, a very sad designer, um, at least for most of us. Um, back up to the goal. This is just something I try to embed in my designers as they come into their careers. Um, when there's a disagreement... Don't fight about the solution. Back up to you, agree on something, and then move forward again. Because you have to agree on the goals or everything you say after that doesn't matter. So if you're in a disagreement with someone in the engineering or art, back up, quit talking about that, and go, well, here's our goals. Do we at least agree on that first? Because until you align there, you can't move forward. And often there is a misalignment, but nobody knows it because no one backed up. Um, design with intention. Um, it doesn't matter how cool it is. If you don't have a reason to design that system, it's probably going to fall short. So all my designers, when they have these big design docs and they want to tell me everything about it, and they're, you know, I don't care how smart you are. I care about what you're giving the player. Tell me the intentions that the, play, the value the player is going to get out of this first. Because if I, can't, if I don't have that, I can't evaluate anything else you're telling me. So always start with your goals. Um, start with your intentions. Um, Last one, as I just said, I don't care how smart you are. If you're the smartest person in the room, no one else is going to care either. When you talk to people, inspire them. Don't show them how smart you are. Tell them the story. Tell them the experience. You'll get to how smart it is and how great it is later when you have to talk about the details. But if you want someone to take your designs or your ideas and go, inspire them first. That is huge. Okay. 
Dream big, last one. Always dream big. I don't care how much time you have, what your team is, what your tech is. Dream big first and then narrow it down. And lean on to people around you to figure out how to narrow it down to something that's doable. Because if you put yourself in a box, I know you can get creative in a box and with boundaries. I, I know all that as well. But if you narrow your ideas down too much, it becomes instinct to do it. And you do it thinking that you know what it takes for an art team to do it. Uh, this is harsh, but I, I have one designer I always tell, don't be an asshole. He's like, well, art's going to take, they don't have time to do this. And I'm like, you're an asshole. He's like, why? And I'm like, because you're pretending you know what it is to do their job. That's an asshole. Quit being an asshole. Ask them if they can do this. And if they say no, go, how can we achieve this? Like, so dream big. Always dream big. Okay, questions, if I have any time. Nine minutes. Sweet. Hello, hello. Yes. Let's take from the audience first. Hello, thank you so much for the presentation. Well, uh, I'm an inspiring game designer slash narrative designer slash uh, game writer. Um, so I was wondering what would be a good exercise or a small project that I could work on if I want to train that narrative design muscle, especially when it's just me on my own. Um, how would I go about that? So it depends on, I don't know enough about your skills, but if, if you want to limit your technical skills, um, find something that's an existing tool out there that you can build something in already. There's all kinds of uh, mods and tools out there now that you can go build narrative driven games in go do it go pick one um, find out what it's capable of and then break it and make it do something it's not capable of because usually you can pretty pretty easily um, but the biggest thing is just keep doing it makes just keep making because that's the first thing yeah, we, ha um, we will do one from the online now. Most people aren't going to read large blocks of text, <laughs> so I'm sure there has to be a stylistic visual element to our samples. What is the best way to showcase a, a narrative portfolio? So I think there's different skills and that, we, that I look for in narrative. Visual storytelling is one of them, as, as you spoke to without words, basically. Um, many of our games have a screen that is an image that tells a story, and narrative designers design those. So if you want to build a portfolio, I mean, of course you want to do some writing. You want to have some writing examples, but do world creation examples, do storytelling through different ways or approaches. You could do a comic book framing, kind of blocking storytelling. You can do a single image storytelling. Um, I think two, two, two of our current games all the narratives told through through images that rather unlock pieces as you play or give you the whole image just to tell you the general story. So, yeah, something like that. One from the audience. Uh, thanks so much for the talk. It was really, really great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> refreshing. Um, I was on, kind of on the same portfolio side of things. I'm very cognizant of a hiring manager as limited time. And so could you speak to an efficient way of displaying process? Because I have a lot of writing samples and things like that. Like I'm a primarily a game writer, but also do some narrative design. And um, I'm always worried that uh, I'm going to waste somebody's time or they're going to see my you know, explanation of a system I've designed. And they're like, oh, God, I don't want to go through all that think how I want to answer this. As I say, I put my foot in my mouth way too many times. Um, um, honestly, when, when, when people come to me through our TA team, our talent acquisition team, um, looking at their portfolio is almost the last thing I do, honestly. I look at what they've done. I look at what they're doing on their own to evolve what they do. Uh, again, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, I look for the passion in what they're doing more than anything. Um, so really your portfolio, I'm going to get to it, but it's not the first thing I look at. I'm really looking at the person first. Um, I probably even have an ad, uh, kind of an odd interview process where I s speak to the, almost everybody in the design department pretty quickly in their interview process instead of last. And my, my whole interview is very conversational, similar to this, where I really just talk about who you are what your passions are, what your game experiences are, um, what your, th I ask a lot of interesting questions to hear how you think. I always tell people, think out loud. I want to, there's no wrong answer as much as, I just want to hear the process that you, 
walk through to get to the answer Um, because we can fight about right or wrong all day and that's silly Um, so as far as your portfolio I mean when I get to those just something creative something unique um, something that catches my attention in some storytelling way Um, it can be a character it could be a world piece Um, I'm trying to think how would I answer what catches my mind uh, or catches my eye Um, something unique something different not something standard or even you could do a parody of another game and totally do something interesting that way that would catch my attention as well something witty right you know narrative is often you want somebody who's fairly witty uh, and can be interesting that way as well yes last question what is the best way for someone to break into narrative design if they don't have an academic background or don't have uh, relevant game design experience just do it do it indie do it on your own fail do it horribly do it again keep doing it um, I got in through QA 25 years ago so that's the way we used to do it there was no school so um, if you don't have the academic which is fine like I said I, I it's not a requirement but if you don't have it your passion to just do it is key whether you're in a company or not fine I mean Helsinki is Finland is great with gains the industry is great I mean it's it's so uh, arms open and all the companies share and talk um, we do interns and trainees all the time many of them get hired um, if we have headcount so um, just you have to be willing to risk um, I just had a trainee from Stockholm who he's you know late 20s had a good job but he wanted to get into games I said I'll give you a trainee but you're gonna make less than you're making now and it's not permanent it's a risk he took the risk and now he's permanent he, he got in so you have to be willing to take the risk. Maybe some very last question from the audience. You have a question? Then uh, I'll ask from the um, from the online. Um, can person break into narrative design or level design if he do, if he's not a writer? Of course, of course. Thank you. With that, thank you very very much. For thank the you. Presentation.